Hello and welcome back to a new session from the Divine Healing Teaching Series. As you probably remember, we are still in Chapter 6 where we talk about how to believe for our healing. And today we are going to discuss the last subchapter of this big chapter, the subchapter 10, which is entitled The Violent Take It By Force. And I'm talking here about the kingdom, that the kingdom of God is supposed to be taken violently. And we'll see what, is this, what this is all about. If you have your Bibles ready, let's just start by reading a first passage from Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, but you're welcome to use any English translation that you have available. Let's read it together. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. This is what this passage says. The violent take the kingdom of God by force. Many Christians today are not walking in the kingdom of God and in all the promises of God because of a passive attitude. And it's so prevalent, so common in the body of Christ today. I don't know why that happens. Because the devil is very violent against us, which are, who are new, the new creations, who are believers in Christ. But for some reason, we have become so passive. And when we talk about the grace of God and about God doing everything for us, about waiting on the Lord or entering into His rest, we automatically think that we don't need to do anything. That's what the that's the common uh, that's the common way of doing things in the body of Christ. I'm not saying everywhere is like that, but most of the times we are like that. We are passive. In reality, waiting upon the Lord or entering into the rest of the Lord is everything but passive. Is everything except passive. Entering into the rest of the Lord is not a passive thing. It's an aggressive thing. It's an active thing. What does it mean to take the kingdom of God by force and in a violent way uh, that this passage talks about? What does it mean to be violent in the spirit? That's what we're talking about today. People have a hard time to make a difference between violence in the physical realm and violence in the spiritual realm. They are a little bit different. They are not the same. Violent in the spirit doesn't mean you have to scream, move, do something physical. That's not violence in the spirit. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, says the Bible. And our violence should never be against people, but against the forces of darkness and of evil. That's the violence we're talking about, the violence in the spirit. And the word violent in dictionary means this, to use force to cause harm or damage to someone or something. We should cause damage and harm to the kingdom of darkness. Another definition is to trying to attack something or someone because of anger. So damaging the kingdom of darkness should be motivated by anger. Have you noticed that in the Bible, all the people that got a hold of, of a miracle were violent people? Example, the blind man on the side of the road who was shouting for Jesus. Jesus, son of David, stop. If, I don't know if you saw the movie. Uh, Jesus, he was shouting, Jesus, wait, wait, I need something. He was violent. The woman with the issue of blood, he, she had tenacity. The four guys carrying a friend on a stretcher. Most Christians would have said in their case, in their shoes, it must not be the will of God. Maybe another day or another time. If it's the will of God, it will happen. No, no, no. You see, the, the, when they got at the door and there was no room inside, what did they do? They refused to give up. They didn't say, oh, it's not the will of God. Oh, let's come another time. Maybe it will be the perfect timing. No, they refused to give up. That spiritual violence, refusing to give up on the word of God. When we face challenges, when we face things from the evil, evil world, from the evil, from the kingdom of darkness, 
we should never give up on the word of God until we see it through, until we see it fulfilled in our lives and in the lives of other people around us. That's violence in the spirit. And being violent in the spirit involves three things, at least three things that I found. First, having a strong conviction. Being violent in the spirit means to have a strong conviction about the word of God. You come to a point where you are so convinced and so persuaded of something. And that something is the word of God. Second thing. The second thing is having anger against negative situations. I'm either going to swim or sink. That's the attitude. Having anger against the negative situations. Get it or die. This is the attitude. A refusal to receive anything other than the will of God or God's best. I remember an example. Uh, a preacher were, was telling a story that he went to Africa and he preached uh, a similar message on healing. And after the message, he went to, ha to have lunch and to eat. And, and when he came back uh, uh, to, the, to the conference room where he was, uh, where he was preaching, uh, he, he was supposed to continue, he saw people praying for each other. He heard miracles happening so fast. And he asked the local pastor, how come when I preach here the message, people are so quickly healed and miracles start happening and things are happening. And when I preach in my own country, they, it, had, it takes so much time and so much talk to convince people to start believing this message. And you know what the local pastor said? You know, here in Africa, we don't have so many options like hospitals, medicines, like in other places, other countries. Here, if you don't believe, you die. And that's the attitude. That's why miracles happen in that place. Because we need to have that attitude of faith where you either get it or you die. There's no alternative. There's no option. Yes, I know we have many options. And sometimes those options damage our faith in the word. Because we have alternatives and then we accept easy what the devil puts in our way. But the second thing that defines someone violent in the spirit or defines Violence in the spirit is having anger against negative situations that come to our, in, our, in our path. And the third thing that defines violence in the spirit is having a tenacity to follow through. Having a tenacity to follow through. That means the willingness to fight, to defend or obtain for as long as it takes. I stand there. That's the third attribute of being violent in the spirit that we want to talk about and we'll take them one by one there are a lot of people that want to be healed today as you may as you may suppose they are struggling with a sickness maybe you struggle with a sickness i struggle with sickness they struggle for a while with it and they they know a lot about healing about uh, teaching about what the bible says but it's like they are still living with that thing with that sickness and it may, be, it, it may be happening to you right now. It happened to me and it's still happening in some areas. It's like they can't get rid of it. It's like you cannot get rid of that sickness. You prayed, you know a lot, but it just doesn't go. And most of the times it's because without realizing it in a subtle way, we've accepted it, we've become passive about it and we are not violent against it anymore and that's why it's, it lingers there that's why it still stays there because we have become passive towards it we have accepted it slowly in our minds and in our lives and it's the violent that will take it by force it's the violent people in the spirit that get results in healing and in other areas in the in spiritual matters Let's read one more, one more passage from Mark chapter 11, verse 24. This message is, is what defines me. It's, that, it's what I like best. The spirit of faith, the spirit of conquering, of overcoming, and not of being passive and accepting things to come and trample upon us. And that's how Joshua and Caleb were when they conquered Canaan. I, the, if you read in the Bible, you see the same spirit. We will eat them. They are food for us. If God is for us, who can be against us? While all the other people were complaining and crying, these two men, they were, had this violence in the spirit. They, they were trusting the word of God. That they, they, 
the word of God and what God said will give them victory. And no matter what giant will come their way, they will be able to defeat it. And the same spirit David, King David had when he faced the giant. And that he was violent in the spirit. He was violent about what God said, about the covenant that he had with God. Let's read Mark eleven twenty four. 24. says this, For this reason I say to you, whatever you pray and ask for, believe that you have received it, and it will be done for you. The word receive in the prayer of faith above in this passage in the Greek also means to take. It's the word lambano. It's not a passive receive. You just wait and something comes up. It's the word Greek word lambano, which means to take aggressively. The word receive there is to take it for you. It's there. It's already promised. It's given, but you need to go to take and take it. It's like what happens with us uh, when someone sends a parcel, a package to us, and uh, the post, the mail, uh, the mail company doesn't bring it to your door. And you just take it but they bring it to a branch to a, a place uh, in their company and then you have to go and pick it up and take it that's kind of the difference you don't wait to receive it it's already given you must take it actively that's the word used here in this verse believe that you have received it believe and take it and when you pray you must believe that you're taking when you're praying you're taking something that god has already provided and we know it has already been given, but we also have an enemy that will not let us have it easily. He will fight us. That's why it's so hard. God has given it to us, but the enemy will not, will not let us have it easily. He will fight for it. And many times it's beyond receiving. You just have to take it. It's yours by faith, what God has given us. So let's begin by uh, let's begin uh, talking about the first thing that defines violence in the spirit and I was saying it was having a strong conviction. And let's read Romans chapter 4 verses 19 to 21. I think I read it uh, again in the previous session it talks about Abraham and his faith and says this and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what had promised he was ab also able to perform. How did Abraham get fully convinced? How do you think that happened? He didn't, consider, he, he didn't consider his body already dead, but the promise of God. He didn't look at his body, but at the promise of God. Stop considering the circumstances of your body or your body and start considering the promises of God to you in his word. That's how you get fully convinced. You don't consider the negative situations, the negative circumstances that are coming your way. But in every situation, you are considering what the word of God says about you and about that situation. How do you consider something? I was talking about considering. You fix your attention and focus not on your body or on symptoms or circumstances, but you fix your attention of the mind on the word. So you focus, you concentrate, you focus your mind on the word, your thoughts on the word. And to consider is to fix one's mind and attention on something, to put your attention on something, not on your symptoms, not on the circumstances, but on the word of God. And you have to be fully convinced, not just partially. You see what the Bible says? Abraham was fully convinced, fully persuaded, not partially. It sounds easy, but it's not. It's simple, but not easy to be persuaded, to be convinced. It's simple, but not easy. It's the hardest thing to do. Because if it was easy, everybody would do it. Isn't that right? So it's simple. It's very simple. You need to be convinced. 
but it's not easy. It's hard, but it's not undoable. It's not impossible because if it were, God would not expect us to have that and he would not have given us all the tools that we need to have that kind of faith and to release that kind of faith. Let's move on and read one more passage from Numbers chapter 21 verses 4 to 9. It says this uh, about the people of Israel. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people. And many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made the bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Amen. So here we have a situation where people of Israel sinned and murmured against the Lord and, Lord sent, and the Lord sent some venomous, uh, venomous serpents and they were beating them uh, and they were killing them. And they were getting bit by snakes which were everywhere. God sent a lot of snakes and they were beaten by these snakes. And God tells them here to take, he doesn't just come and takes away the snakes. What, does, what is the solution that God gives them? God tells them to take their eyes off from the snakes and put it on the bronze snake. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't just come and save them, but he tells them to do something in order to be saved from those snakes. Why bronze, you might ask? Why a bronze serpent? Because in the tabernacle, all the furniture of bronze from the outer court had to do with the judgment of sin. God doesn't do things by coincidence. Everything has a significance. Everything means something in the Bible. So bronze was a symbol of judgment of sin. All the other furniture that had to do with the presence of God in the tabernacle were from gold, which is a, it's a difference there. Bronze is a symbol of sin being judged. And that pole where the bronze snake was lifted up meant that sin and sickness were going to be judged on that pole. And the word look in this passage that we just read is in, in Hebrew is the, word, is the Hebrew word nabat. And it means to look with intensity, to fix your eyes and attention on something. Behold, you know, many verses say, behold. Fix your attention with intensity. Consider. Gaze on it. That's what the word Hebrew word Nabat means. Look with intensity. Fix your eyes and attention on something. So in the middle of pain, God tells them to do this. Don't look at, at what's around you. Don't pay attention to the pain, to your body, to what you hear, to what you see to what you feel going between your legs. Imagine that. Put yourself in, the, in, in, in their shoes. But what does God tell them, tell them to do? Look to the serpent of bronze lifted up in front of you. Don't look around you. And it seems easy, but try to put yourself in their shoes. Have you ever seen a venomous snake or a big spider coming towards you or crawling, feeling how it crawls on you? Ah, it's, it's, it's not nice. And a lot of you are probably scared. Don't, you don't even want to think about it. Do you think in, in that kind of situation, is, it's easy to look at that pole when you feel that spider or snake crawling on you? It's not easy. It's simple, but not easy to just disconsider what's happening around you and just look at the bronze serpent that God put there to save you. It's not easy, but it can be done. And John chapter 3 verse 14 to 15 in the New Testament says this. Get, uh, uh, talks about this example about what Moses did and, and then extrapolates it to the New Testament. 
And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. So Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is that serpent that took away all the, all the judgment for sin and sickness. And whoever looks on Him has eternal life. Whoever believes, you see, to look to Him, verse 15 says, whoever believes in Him. To look at Him is to believe what He has said. To fix your attention to what Jesus had said. To what God has said in the Word about you. And that serpent of bronze was a type and a shadow of what Jesus was going to do for us at the cross. When he was lifted up on the cross. Jesus was lifted up on the cross and he was judged. And he became sin for us and a curse for us. That's what the 2 Corinthians 5.21 says. He became sin. The, who knew no sin, uh, so that we might become his righteousness. And John chapter 12, verses 31 to 32 says this. Jesus says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all to myself. Uh, uh, many English translation, uh, translations out there will draw all people to myself but the word people is not in the original in the original manuscript the translators added it to try to make sense what that all means but the context of this passage if you look carefully is judgment is not people jesus says now is the judgment of this world and i if i'm lifted up will draw all judgment to myself so when Jesus says he will draw all to himself, he doesn't refer to people, which is not in the original translation, as I said, but to all judgment. All judgment will be drawn into Jesus. And that's what he did when he was on the cross and then he, was, he ascended to heaven. All judgment for sin and sickness was drawn into him, was put on him. And if the people of Israel could survive, could receive life and healing just by looking at the bronze serpent, you know, they were healed. Whenever they looked, they were healed. And if that happened to them, how much more should we be healed when we look at what Jesus Christ did on the cross? Especially since the Bible makes that comparison. As Moses lifted up the bronze serpent, in the same way Jesus Christ was lifted up. And if we believe in Him, we receive life. That life that is able to heal our bodies and to heal others around us. Eternal life is not just life, existence without end in the future life. Eternal life is the life and nature of God from the realm of eternity into our spirits. That's what eternal life is. And it, of course, it includes immortality and life with existence without end. But it's not just that. It's spiritual life. And that life is able to, to heal our bodies and to, to make us well. And faith, if we come back to faith, we're talking about having a strong conviction. Faith is being fully persuaded of something you cannot see. That's why it's so difficult. It's simple but not easy because you have to be convinced of something that you don't, do not see, of something that God has said and is true. It's living, it's active, but you cannot see it. What you see is your circumstance, is your negative circumstance. And 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18 says this, Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, the circumstances, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen 
are eternal. And a lot of Christians interpret the things that are not seen as being the things that we are yet to come in the future life. When you are, dis when you are afflicted that you should think and try to imagine how, well, how good it will be when we'll all get to heaven and try to encourage yourself and focus on that so that you can endure and pass through it. And it's not that. The things that are not seen, the things that are eternal, are they are in the realm of eternity, are the things that God has spoken for you and the spiritual blessings that he has already given you in that realm, in eternity, in the eternal realm, in the heavenly places. So those are the things unseen that we need to focus and look. It says, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at those things which are not seen that God has said about us. And these afflictions create more glory and power if whenever we look at the unseen promises of God in the midst of problems, they work something in us. Because you persevere and you start releasing more faith and you release glory and power. It creates a weight of glory when you just look, you focus. When those people were looking at the bronze serpent, the life of God killed the serpents and healed them. So when you look on the unseen promises of God and focus your mind on those, the glory and the power of God is released. It creates a weight of glory that is released and you're healed and you're delivered, you're made whole. That's how faith works. And that's what it means to have a strong conviction and to be violent about the promises of God that you have in the eternal realm. The second thing I was saying about violent, being violent in the spirit is having anger against the works of darkness. How I like that. Having anger against the works of darkness. And many Christians stop being angry on the works of the devil. They are so passive in the name of love. They are so passive they, and they accept anything. But we should love people and hate the devil. We are sons and daughters of the Almighty God, the devil's master, and people's servants. We serve people, we love people, but we hate evil, we hate darkness. We are angry about darkness, about the works of the devil. And these Christians, many Christians see anger as a negative thing, but it's not always a negative thing. And that, that is what makes them passive, thinking that anger is negative. When you stop getting angry at something, you start accepting it. And that's the, the bad part of it. When you stop being angry about the works of the devil, you begin accepting them. And when you begin tolerating something, you accept it. And when, when what you accept will dominate you. That's why we're dominated by sickness. That's why we're dominated by the works of darkness. Because we tolerated them, we accepted it, and now they dominate us. Now it's harder for us to, to stand up to them. Because we allowed, uh, we allowed the devil and we allowed sickness too much time, too long to dominate us. We learn to accept it and to live with it. And we have to be motivated by anger. We need to get angry again. It might sound funny for you and strange, but we need as Christians to get angry again on the devil and on sickness. And Romans 12, 9 says this, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. See what the Bible says? Abhor what is evil. Be angry about the evil. And Proverbs 8, 13 says this, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate. See what God says? He hates evil. He hates uh, the evil way and the perverse mouth. Hating something means being angry against that, being angry about it. And we think hate or anger is a bad thing, but it's not always when it comes to evil and darkness. And I'm talking about poverty, I'm talking about sickness, I'm talking about lack. When you see where it comes from, it will make you angry and it should make us angry. When we see all where from, where from the, all these things come, like lack, sickness, poverty, curse, where do they come from? From the devil. 
That should make us angry and we should allow that anger to rise up within us because that's what will give us victory and will help, will help us see results on the Word of God. Let's move on. Romans 5 verse 12 says this, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, death entered the world through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned in Adam. The, he, he first sinned and then because of him, because he was our federal father, we all sinned in front of God and we all offended God. So when we think about hating evil, we immediately think about only hating sin or sinful actions. That's the first reaction. Oh yeah, we must hate sin. And we hate sin, right? But let's take sickness for example. How did sickness get into this world? What does this verse say? Romans 5, 12. How did sickness get into the world? Most people will hate sin, but sickness, we've learned to live with it, as I said before. We've learned to tolerate it and accept it. We've learned to live and manage our lives around it, around our sicknesses. And we learned, we've learned to cope with it. And that's not good. How did sickness get into this world? Through sin, death entered the world and spread to all men. This verse says that when sin entered the world, through sin, death entered into the world and spread to all men. Sickness, poverty, lack, they are all a form of death, of spiritual death. Sickness, lack, poverty is death, is not life. When sin got into the world, it opened the door to death, to spiritual death. Why do we hate sin but tolerate sickness and lack, which are also the works of the devil? Why do we hate only sinful actions when we should hate all the effects of sin, all the death that came into the world through sin? How does God look at sin, sickness and lack? How do you think God looks at sin, sickness and lack? Does he ever accept it or tolerate it? Do you see Jesus ever accepting sickness and lack and tolerating them, those while he was on earth? No, of course not. Does God like those? Does God like sickness or lack? God hates sin. That's what the Bible says. If sickness, corruption and lack came together with sin, when Adam sinned, that means God has the same attitude against those things as he has against sin. Isn't that right? If he hates sin, he also hates the effects of sin. Sickness, lack, poverty, curse, depression, fear, all those things. And we have to learn to look at sickness and lack in the same way we look at sin as an enemy. Sickness and lack are our enemies. Death is an enemy of God, the Bible says. That means sickness is an enemy of God just like sin is and our sinful actions. Lack is the enemy of God just like sin is. They are all enemies of God and we need to learn and understand that, that sickness and lack and poverty, they are all enemies of God. God himself, and we'll see now, God himself calls sickness and lack a curse. You know where? In Deuteronomy 28. And we'll take the time to read it all. And you hear people saying today that sickness or lack is sometimes a blessing. That God sometimes wants to use it to perform a work in our heart and to bless our heart and to work something good in our lives. No, sickness is a curse and a work of the devil. And let's read Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 to 68, so not the whole chapter. But while I'm reading, I want us to observe and notice where, where is God, what, how is God calling sickness. Let's read it together. But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. So he lists now all the curses. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the country. 
Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl, your basket and your bowl, your food and your drink. They will be cursed. In other words, your prosperity will be cursed. You, it will become lack. Verse 18. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of your land. The fruit of your body are your children. And the produce of your land is your business, your prosperity, your money. And they will be cursed when? When you don't obey the Lord. The, God calls that curse. So lack, the land not producing its curse. The increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. That's again your prosperity. And whenever you don't have those, the, the, your cattle and flocks don't increase. It means they are cursed. It's something that God, it, it was a punishment from, from God for not obeying the law. So it, it cannot be a blessing. Let's continue reading. 19, verse 19. Cursed shall you be when you come in, and cursed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will send on you cursing, confusion, and rebuke in all that you set your hand to do. Psalm 1 says, when what, what, the righteous man, when whatever he puts his hands to, he prospers until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly. So <clears throat> let me read again. The Lord will send on you cursing, confusion, and rebuke in all that you set your hand to do until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doings in which you have forsaken me. The Lord will make the plague cling to you until he has consumed you from the land which you are going to possess. The Lord will strike you with consumption, with fever, with inflammation, with severe burning fever, with the sword, with scorching, and with mild you. They shall pursue you until you perish. The, all these are punishment, are death. And your heavens which are over your head shall be bronze, and the earth which is under you shall be under you shall be iron. The Lord will change the rain of your land to powder and dust. Dust From the heaven it shall come down on you until you are destroyed. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. And you shall become troublesome to all the kingdoms of the earth. So whenever you are defeated by your enemies, it's a curse. Your carcasses shall be food for all the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and no one shall frighten them away. The Lord will strike you with the boils of Egypt, with tumors, with the scab, and with the itch, from which you cannot be healed. The Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of the heart. And you shall grope at noonday as a blind man gropes in darkness. You shall not prosper in your ways." So before, before this curse, the blessing of God is that you should prosper, right? Because it, since this is a, is a punishment. You shall not prosper in your ways. You shall be only oppressed and plundered continually, and no one shall save you. I will stop here and say all these curses from Deuteronomy 28, they were put on the cross, Galatians says. Jesus Christ took all the curse of the law on himself. He withdrew it in himself, the Galatians says. The, what is the curse of the law? Exactly what I'm reading here. All the punishment for not obeying the law. For Even when you sin, the punishment for that sin, whenever you do sinful actions, the curses and the punishment that should come on you, like lack of prosperity, sickness, boils, tumors, they were all judged and taken by Jesus. That's why we're no longer cursed whenever we sin. We're no, we, have, we are entitled and we have access only to the blessings from Deuteronomy 28. Because Jesus Christ took all the punishment and paid for our blessings. I wanted to say this because now as I continue reading, it will make more sense to you. This punishment, this sickness, lack of prosperity, they were taken by Jesus, and now we have access only to prosperity, only to healing. Verse 30, 30. You shall betroth a wife, but another man shall lie with her. You shall build a house, but you shall not dwell in it. You shall plant a vineyard, but shall not gather its grapes. Your ox shall be slaughtered before your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. 
Your donkey shall be violently taken away from before you and shall not be restored to you. Your sheep shall be given to your enemies and you shall have no one to rescue them. Your sons and your daughters shall be given to another people and your eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all day long. And there shall be no strength in your hand. A nation whom you have not known shall eat the fruit of your land and the produce of your labor, and you shall be only oppressed and crushed continually. Isn't that what happens today in, in churches in most Christians' lives? We are crushed continually by sickness. That's not God's will. We are continually oppressed by the devil, crushed continually by sickness and lack, and we accept it. We allow it in our lives and it should not be so because that's the devil's oppression. We should say no to it. Stop to it. Verse 34. So you shall be driven mad because of the sight which your eyes see. The Lord will strike you in the knees and on the legs with severe boils which cannot be healed. And from the sole of your foot to the top of your head. Again, it talks about sickness here. The Lord will bring you and the king whom you set over you. To a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known. And there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone. And you shall become an astonishment, a proverb and a byword among all nations where the Lord will drive you. You shall carry much seed out to the field, but gather little in. For the locust shall consume it. So many times we invest and then we, we produce, we harvest a little. Why? Because the locust, the devil has consumed it. If you are a Christian, that should not be so. You shall plant vineyards and tend them, but you shall neither drink or of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worms shall eat them. You shall have olive trees throughout all your territory, but you shall not anoint yourself with the oil, for your olives shall drop off. You shall beget sons and daughters, but they shall not be yours, for they shall go into captivity." Locusts shall consume all your trees and the produce of your land. See that in a significant way. Translate that to, to our day and age. How will these things translate while I'm reading? The alien who is among you shall rise higher and higher above you and shall come down lower and lower and you shall come down lower and lower. See, God doesn't like that. That's a punishment when you go lower and lower and the enemy or someone else goes higher and higher. And is blessed. God doesn't want that for you. Since this was a punishment. He shall lend to you. But you shall not lend to him. He shall be the head. And you shall be the tail. That's not humility. When you're, whenever you're the tail. That means the devil has crushed you. Has oppressed you. And you're staying there. That's not humility. Humility he can manifest when you trust the word of God. You are humble before God. Not before the devil. You are not called to be humble before the devil. You are called to be humble before God and before other people. Verse 45. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon you and pursue and overtake you until you are destroyed because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he, which he commanded you. And they shall be upon you for a sign and a wonder and on your descendants forever because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything. See? When you serve the Lord with joy and gladness of heart in the Old Testament, you would have abundance of everything. Therefore, you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, and in need of everything. See, hunger, thirst, nakedness, in need of everything. That's a curse. And when, it, when God says, I will send to you, he's not actually directing, directly sending sickness. He's just taking his hand off, his hand of protection, his hand of healing, and the devil takes off. That's how it happens. The, the, God never is never tempted to do evil. He doesn't produce sickness. The devil is the one producing sickness and lack on the earth. And even when God sent the angel of death, the Bible says in, in Egypt, he was not the one sending the angel of death. He was the one taking his hands off and allowing the angel of death to come and take other people while he was still protecting Goshen, where the people of God were. 
And, he, and verse 48, I'll continue. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies, a nation whose language you will not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which does not respect the elderly nor show favor to the young. And they shall eat the increase of your livestock and the produce of your land until you are destroyed. They shall not leave your grain or new wine or oil or the increase of your cattle or the offspring of your flocks until they have destroyed you. They shall besiege you at all your gates until your high and fortified walls in which you trust come down throughout all your land and they shall besiege you at all your gates throughout all your land which the Lord your God has given you. You shall eat the fruit of your own body the flesh of your sons and your daughters whom the Lord your God has given you in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you. The sensitive and very refined man among you will be hostile toward his brother, toward the wife of his bosom, and toward the rest of his children whom he leaves behind, so that he will not give any of them the flesh of his children whom he will eat, because he has nothing left in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you at all your gates. The tender and delicate woman among, among you who would not venture to set the sole of her foot on the ground because of her delicateness and sensitivity will refuse to the husband of her bosom and to her son and her daughter. Her placenta which comes out from between her feet and her children whom she bears for she will eat them secretly for lack of everything in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you at all your gates. At all your gates, all around you, from everywhere, distress will come to you. This is punishment. This is curse, which is not supposed to happen to the people of God in the New Testament, to the new creation. If you do not carefully observe all the words of this law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God. Then the Lord will bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary plagues, great and prolonged plagues, and serious and prolonged sicknesses. Who fulfilled the law for us? Because we can never fulfill the law. But Jesus Christ fulfilled the law while he lived on earth for us. So if we put our trust in him, we are no longer called to experience this punishment because we have already fulfilled all the law in Jesus Christ. That's why God will, ne will no longer never send on us sicknesses and curses and plagues. Moreover, he will bring on you all the diseases of Egypt, says here, when you don't listen, of which you were afraid and they shall cling to you. Verse 61, also, every sickness and every plague which is not written in this book of the law will the Lord bring upon you until you are destroyed. You shall be left few in number, whereas you were as the stars of heaven in multitude, because you would not obey the voice of your Lord your God. But we have obeyed in Christ, the Lord our, of our God. And it shall be that just as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and multiply you. See, the Lord loves the word multiplication. Multiply your business, multiply your money, multiply your health, your relationships, your kids, your children. So the Lord will re rejoice over you to destroy you and bring you to nothing. And you shall be plucked from off the land which you go to possess. Then the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other. And there you shall serve other gods which neither you nor your fathers have known, wood and stone. And among those nations... You shall find no rest when you don't have rest. When you're worried, you're stressed. Nor shall the sole of your foot have a resting place. But there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing eyes and anguish of the soul. Your life shall hang in doubt before you. You shall fear day and night. That's a curse. Fear, it's a curse. And have no assurance of life. In the morning you shall say, oh, that it, that it were evening. And at evening you shall say, oh, that it was, it was morning. Because of the fear which terrifies your heart and because of the sight which your eyes see. And the Lord will take you back to Egypt 
in ships by the way of which I said to you, you shall never see it again. And there you shall be offered for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but no one will buy you. I took the time, I know it's a long passage, but I wanted you to see how much God hates sickness and lack and poverty. And in the New Testament, that's why he sent Jesus so that all those punishments, all those curses will not come on his children anymore. Someone will fulfill the law, all his requirements, all the requirements of holiness, and will also pay for the penalty of the, uh, the breaking of the law. Jesus not only fulfilled the law and he obeyed the law and he lived the law while he was on earth, but at the cross, he also paid for every breaking of the law so that we would have access only to blessing. That's why the blessings of the Old Testament and much more are ours today. Amen? And they are also physical, not just spiritual. And this is so powerful. So we, so we talked about today about being violent in the spirit. We talked about having a strong conviction and having anger against negative situations. And in the next session, we'll continue talking about this second thing, having anger against negative situation. And we'll also talk about the third thing, the tenacity of faith. And it's powerful and exciting. And I hope this message brought life and faith to you in your spirit to go there and hate evil, hate sickness, wherever you see it. Take the opportunity to fight, and exercise your faith, to create that weight of glory that will bless other people and will bless yourself. And if you have a sickness in your body that you have accepted for too long, take a stand today and command it in Jesus' name to leave your body. You were healed by Jesus' stripes once and for all. And that sickness is illegal in your body, is harassing you, is oppressing you, is crushing you. Get it out in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for such a great inheritance. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the gift of faith. Thank you for eternal life. Thank you for the Holy Spirit and the fullness of the Spirit in our lives. Thank you, Father, that we are more than overcomers. And greater is He who is in us than he that is in the world. Amen. May God bless you and fill you with his favor until we see you again next time. Amen.